we're going to have a, a panel discussion now. And before we do that, I just wanted um, to make clear a lot of the questions that were, that were asked to us. So we put out a, a request on social media to have questions asked to us over the last two and a half weeks. And we received so many questions, it was unbelievable. And many of the questions were the same, but just phrased in different ways. And to best utilize all of our time, what I, wanted, what I did was I collated them to basically make all the various questions asking the same thing into one, and then I prioritize them based on who, how many people asked that question. So I'm going in order, which may seem a little bit strange on the order I'm going in, based on what our community felt were the most important questions they wanted answered, and this is the most efficient way to get the most questions asked. Um, if there are more questions that you have um, at the end, we'll leave room for you guys just to come up and have spontaneous questions as well. Um, but you know, the biggest questions have kind of been asked throughout the course of the day. And so if we can avoid asking the same question we asked throughout the course of the day, that would just speed things along so that we can ensure that we get everything answered. Um, everyone, you know, the first question that everyone wants to know is what age are you starting? When are you starting? What genotype are you starting in? And that was everybody's question. That was the first 50 questions from everybody. And I think the bottom line is we can ask each person that's going to be on this panel and, and they can start coming up, but the bottom line is they're not going to answer that question. So you can ask it, but we're going to waste about 10 minutes of time going through everyone because they can't. It's not because they don't want to, but until the FDA acknowledges and gives permission and a green light to say you can start in this age group at this dose, at this frequency, at this time, they're going to be making a promise to you that's false and may change. So no one wants to break our heart, which is why they're not answering these questions. So don't feel that anyone's trying to just keep it away from you. It's just not the right thing to do as a company to answer these questions. But I can tell you every one of them, because we talk to all of them, their goal is to treat every patient as quickly as possible in every genotype at every age. So it doesn't matter if you're 25 or if you're five months. The goal is to get these therapies to all of you as quickly as possible, and it's going to start with small numbers, but it's going to be fast, and so just hang in there, but understand no one's going to answer that question, so I don't want to disappoint you. Okay, everybody come up. This mic again. D uh, Dr. Jim Wilson, Dr. Art Baudet, Dr. Scott Stromat, Jennifer Panagoulias, Lauren Black, Jessica Duis, Ed Weber, Michelle Krishnan, Emil Kakis. Larry Glass, Matthew, um, Matthews from Ovid, um, Dr. Abedi, unfortunately, with the Metabolic Stem Cell Program, had to catch a flight. Um, but I know a, a heck of a lot about that program. So if anyone has questions directed at that program, I'm happy to answer them or email them to him and then put it on social media so everyone can get the answer. And um, Dr. Becky Cream. Everyone on? All right, so let's just see if we can get more shares. Okay, so
Okay, why don't we get started? Can you hear me okay on this? Okay. So all of you have been, or many of you have been here for the past few years, and I think every year you see that this panel ex gets bigger and bigger. So we had a table that had like six panelists, and then the year after we had a table that had 10 panelists, and now we have a, a panel of maybe 15 panelists. So this is only, a, a, you know, an example of what's yet to come and how many important people are in this room well beyond what's just on the panel to help answer questions and help make us feel comfortable about what's happening for the Angelman community. So this is very exciting. Um, Okay, so I want to um, thank all of you for coming here today and speaking to the uh, community directly. Um, I am sure I speak for every parent in this room when I say it's absolutely amazing to hear these um, updates from all of you today. Uh, three gene-altering therapies marching towards the clinic, clinic trials ongoing, uh, clinical trials starting. It's um, simply breathtaking. There was um, a webinar directed at the Angelman community a couple of weeks ago, and um, uh, I was very concerned about the information that came out of that webinar. There was a lot of misinformation. Um, so I think this community is at a place in time where they have some really serious questions, and they deserve some really serious answers. So I'm very appreciative for all of you coming here and providing those answers today to the best of your ability. We know there's certain things you can't answer. Um, there were many things that, were, that I found concerning on that webinar, but I'm just gonna um, bring up a couple of them because I'm hoping that you guys could address them and give factual information and, um, and appropriate answers. So one, I was a little surprised that the community seems to think that the patient organization's scientific advisory board are the ones that determine the endpoints in a clinical study. So my first question is if you could clear up to the community how endpoints are selected, both primary and secondary, um, because for some reason they think ASF and FAST are choosing those. Um, and then the second question, and I just wanna let you know that we have uh, parents from 17 different countries sitting in this room, and we have many more countries uh, watching on our live stream. We are a global community, and when we think about treatments for Angelman syndrome, we're certainly not thinking of treating just American children. Um, so one of the questions that was posed to the host of the webinar was, when these therapies are approved in the United States, you know, and clearly they were referencing gene and gene altering therapies, um, what will that mean? This particular parent was calling in from Europe. What will that mean for her child in Europe and other children outside of the United States? And um, that parent was told that as soon as something is approved in the United States, every other country could just come here and get those treatments, which I think we can all agree is completely ludicrous. So I was hoping you could address those two things. How do you go about choosing endpoints for your studies, primary, secondary? And then two, what is the plan for these treatments if they're shown to be safe and effective to be available for children outside the United States. You know, what does that process look like? And are any of you thinking of doing clinical trials both in the United States simultaneously ex-US trials? So that was a lot, I apologize. But I'm really grateful that you came to answer these questions. And I think that everyone in this community should know that you deserve real answers to your questions and not opinion, not bias, and you know, know where you're getting your information from. Um, so I'm going to direct that um, at just a couple of individuals so we don't take up the whole afternoon. So I'm actually going to direct that at Michelle, if that's okay, the start of it, because you are from Roche, so you are in Europe, and I feel like you are in Europe, but you're talking a lot in the U.S. and in Europe about clinical trials, and you have an endpoint study. So I feel like you can very beautifully speak to that question, and then I may pick on a couple of other you. Is that okay? Thank you, Alison. I feel like somehow you turned that into a compliment, so thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you. I'll, I'll do my best. So, uh, so the first part of that question about uh, endpoint development, how do, we, how do we select endpoints, that is one of the biggest central questions for the design of trials, as you all appreciate, and that's why you've asked that question. 
I hope that the, the talk I gave earlier today went some way towards um, explaining that because that is actually the process. So it, in reality, it's a combination uh, really, if it's done properly, it should be informed and it should be guided by you, by, by the community, by families, in terms of what's important to families. And that's why it should start with a disease concept model, um, surveys, questionnaires, review of registry data. It should be guided by what's happening in real life and by what's important to families to measure then that work should be done in collaboration um, in terms of developing new scales. So you heard about ORCA today, the communication tool. Um, you've heard about work on sleep. Um, you've heard about a number of different elements that are done in collaboration between uh, academics, um, families, different companies. So it should be something that is drawing from lots of different sources of guidance and information and done according to best practices at that moment in time. At the end of the day, then the decision of which strategy to take. So you heard also this morning there are approaches where you can choose a number of different things to measure. Um, so the first talk this morning was talking about, and, and Emil Kakis talked about the, mul the multi-domain approaches. So you can choose multiple things to measure, or you can choose to measure one thing, so a primary endpoint. That final decision at the end of the day is made by the sponsor of the study. So the sponsor of the study will either be, will either be a company. There are also trials that are run by academics. Um, so that is where the decision is finally made. That has to be agreed by the FDA um, at, or the local health authority of whichever country it's being run in, in terms of whether that is something that um, that is agreed as a reasonable primary endpoint, and then the study should be designed accordingly. That was a long answer. That I was hope. a great answer and okay. an accurate answer. Thank okay. you. And now the Europe question. Okay, and the Europe question. So um, many of the companies here are global, so I can speak for, for Roche Genentech. We are a global company, um, so I wouldn't be able to give you details today of which countries or exactly what that looks like, but what I can say is that we do consider the global uh, picture when we are planning trials, and you will see that in examples of, of other programs that we have running in other rare diseases where we do run trials in various countries, and actually the discussions regarding availability of a, of a drug in a particular country need to be had in that country with the health authority that regulates that country. So there are FDA equivalents for all the countries around the world, and so those discussions need to be had um, in those specific places and geographies. Great, and then I'm gonna just quickly ask each of you who have a program what your global plan is, if you can share to Paula's third question, um, what your global plan is, if you can share that, either where you're starting, where you wanna go, if there's anything that you feel at this point, and many of you may be able to say, I can't answer that, that you might be able to share. Um, we already know Ovid is global, so go ahead and say that, but I already know your clinical trials are global, so feel free to expand upon that. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Matthews, so the answer is yes for Ovid. We are we are global in the sense that we are not just targeting the U.S., but as uh, Amit said this morning, we already have plans to have sites up and running in Europe, in Israel, and also looking at other parts of the world as well. So for us, I think it's a global, it's a global disease. We are going global. And the same for us. Our phase one will be United States and Canada, and then the future trials will be global. And to add a little granularity about filing, the, I, the application for a drug in the U.S. and Canada and U.S. is very similar, different formatted, they have different emphasis, and so those can be done concurrently when you go to file, when you have the phase three data. So our goal would be to do filing throughout the world at the same time. Other countries like South America, uh, they use distributors so they can use your approval in Canada or they can use your approval in the United States to for get approval in their countries. Jennifer, Jennifer, could you want to speak? Just pass it. Or do you have a microphone? Yeah, um, I think Scott covered it for genetics, but I, I would just say, sort of in my past experience with rare disease, um, you know, at different companies, we, we want to develop things globally because 
the different agencies in each country, you know, they, they want to, they, they generally like to see, not in every country, but in the US and Europe, they, they like to see um, patients in their region included in the study because sometimes they think about maybe their response to a drug isn't going to be the same in uh, patients in the United States as it would be like in Japan or in Europe because there may be factors that influence that like genetic factors or practice of medicine different differences in approach so generally speaking especially in a rare disease you want to try to get patients in as many geographies as you can because we don't have to run a study in the United States and then repeat it for Europe so we have to go uh, globally and think globally in, in an effort to try to, to have access to medicines globally as fast as possible. Jessica? We are working on expanding, as we mentioned in the presentation, um, to Australia. And then the formulation is, is available since November, and it's available globally. Ed, do you want to speak to PTC? Well, PTC is a, a global company as well, but uh, at this point in time, we a little early. We wouldn't expand. Yeah. Um, Ionis is not global, um, however, and we don't have an active trial going on right now. But um, it, it, based on some of our other programs and drugs that we do have approved, we have taken a global approach. Um, we have drugs that are approved globally. Um, I think we would probably take that same approach with this program as well. Great, Emil. Oh, Jim, you could go ahead. Well, the, the only point I would uh, say is uh, John Crowley at Amicus has uh, really developed uh, uh, an international strategy for their first product for Fabre, and it's been quite impressive commercial operation, which is not easy to do, and Emma might comment on that. No, no, it's not easy to do. I think uh, Ultranix, we really focus on global access, and even if trials are in one country, the first trial, we always have international participation, and more importantly, the question is how fast is it the filing and approval? And our for our first two programs, we filed in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Brazil, all within one year, and have gotten approval. So we try to focus on compressing that timeline to make it more available more promptly. So if you're in those other areas, we certainly would want to make sure you could take care of. I did want to say something on the endpoints, if all right. Uh, one thing also to remember is that there's an evolution of the process. You start with thinking you're measuring a bunch of things. And then you learn things in the first study. And then you have regulatory discussion. So there's a little bit of evolution of the endpoints over time. And whatever we think we're going to do, sometimes it evolves. And what you end up doing in phase three could be a narrow set that we've learned from and that you've agreed with. There is a regulatory agreement piece to this, because if they don't agree, then you get a good result. You may still have a battle uh, to deal with. So um, I think it's real important to understand that endpoints are not just made by one person sitting there. It's a process, and it's a lot of different participants, and it evolves as you move through. Larry? Yeah, I guess you could argue that Neuron is a global company. I mean, we have three people in Australia, one in Europe, and one in the US. Um, but you know, as I said, we always initiate our trials, in the, do our trials first in the US. We try to engage in Europe as soon as, as we can, which is why we have Orphan designation for in in Europe for for Finitod. Um, we don't have the resources to develop in Europe in parallel uh, or anywhere else in parallel with the U.S. and and frankly, we'd probably be inclined to seek a partner to to do that unless we grow a lot over the next few years. Great, thank you very much. Um, and so I think this also highlights the need for us to understand where there are patients in the world globally. And people are gonna really target the regions where they have the most patients. And sometimes it's hard to get access to know where they are. So if we are participating in the Global Angelman Syndrome Registry, we have a really good sense of what countries have the most patients. And that will help to drive maybe where some of these clinical trials will happen. So I encourage you, if you're not in the Global Angelman Syndrome Registry, especially if you're from other countries, it's very important that you participate. Okay. So, um, I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Dewis, if that's okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm going to put all of you on the spot because I had to pick who I'm asking so we don't take too much time. So the first question was, how is a parent supposed to know what's the best option for their specific child? When we're anticipating an array of multiple medications, multiple modalities, activating the paternal, replacing the gene and downstream therapeutics, how do we make the best decision for our child if we're not scientifically minded? How do you know what's the right course of action to pursue for a young child or for an adult? Because it may be different. Could you give that a try? Um, 
That is a very tough question. Um, you know, I think the short answer to it is you have to talk to your clinicians and the people that know your child. And we're making it a point to understand all the nuances of these trials. Some of it will be practicality of where the trials are located and what's practical for families. Um, some of it will be maybe some of the risks versus benefits that you'll have to talk with your clinicians about. And I can say confidently I've had many of these conversations already as we are primed to start clinical trials very soon. And I can't emphasize enough that as clinicians, we need to work together to try to have an algorithm and a way to try to help navigate that process. And you really should rely on your doctors to help with that. I think that's too much to navigate on your, on your own. I also think just a second to that is to understand that most of your doctors, if you are in most of the country or the world, may not really have a good understanding of what's going on here today. So you're going to go to your doctors and they might say, they may truly believe that gene therapy is like you need a brain transplant, or they may truly believe it's science fiction and it's not real, or they may not understand how much work is going on in the interim space because a lot of it is not published. So it's also important that you rely on your doctors, but educated doctors who understand the space. And that brings the Angelman syndrome clinics and makes them more important because those doctors really have a much better sense of what's going on in the Angelman space than maybe a, a doctor in the middle of Guatemala or Argentina that may not be as well versed in what's going on in the Angelman space. So it's important that you may have to bring information to them. You may have to ask them to watch live streams like this to understand what's happening for them to help you make that decision because you have to really understand where you're getting your information from. And some of us try to make ourselves really overly available and are always happy to talk to other providers. So I can't second that enough. You should make sure your provider talks to someone knowledgeable if you can't if you don't see someone in some of the Angelman-specific clinics or people who are well-versed in Angelman. And there are a lot of them well-versed in Angelman, but there are quite a lot that are not. Um, okay, the next question is, um, will being in one trial preclude you from being in another trial? Because there are so many happening, will we be able to enroll in multiple trials potentially? So I'm gonna direct that question at Dr. Crean. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it, the short answer is it's going to depend. Um, I, I think pretty standard across all the trials, you, you won't be able to be in, the, in two at the same time. I think that's pretty clear. Um, but depending on the trial, they'll have different criteria and each drug and each um, company will decide what's okay and what's not in terms of if you were on another trial, how long you need to be off that drug before you can start into a new one. Um, there may be some trials that go on that would, that would absolutely preclude you from being in others. It's just going to depend on the trial and the different criteria for each study. But that'll all be laid out in the informed consent and the physicians will know it'll be pretty clear. Yeah. And if anyone else, I'm gonna just keep moving along, but if someone feels very passionate about a question that I didn't ask on you, raise your hand, because we can have more than one answer from different people. Um, and, but I think it's, it's clear, once a drug is approved, it's no longer considered an investigational drug. That will then become part of potential maintenance care. And so things could change once we have approvals. Um, the next question is, well, what is the timing? I'm gonna skip that. Um, to any, it's 2020, that's the answer. Um, to any panelist with a hopeful clinical trial in 2020, or maybe 2021 was the question, do you have, and you specifically have a child or a grandchild or a sibling, if it was your decision alone and any one of those people had Angelman syndrome, would you put them in a phase one clinical trial or would you wait? If there are disclaimers for yes or no, if my child had this or that, I would or wouldn't. That's a tough question. But I'm actually gonna just throw that at um, Dr. Baudet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I don't have any clinical trial. Um, That's why I'm throwing it at right. you because I don't uh, want anyone to speak who does have a clinical trial because they're clearly biased. Actually, I, I think there's a big challenge for the Angelman community here. Um, it's, it sounds good to say, ask your doctor, if your doctor's a neurologist. Or, but they're not gonna know, and even the people of us sitting up here, if we were to give the best answer for an individual patient, we'd have to hear exactly what each company is offering. 
and what the pros and cons of that might be. I guess the Angelman clinicians who see lots of patients across the world who are not tied to a particular trial probably are the best source and, and maybe some of them should get together and communicate around the world and maybe even occasionally issue some statements of trying not to politicize it one company versus another, but here are some considerations that we think are relevant. I, I think if you ask your neurologist what to do, he, you know, he'll buy you a drink. Uh, <laughs> And I think you also have to be careful because a lot of the clinicians are partially funded by some of these companies. And so there's conflict of interest in everything we do and we also have to be careful of that as well. Yeah, that, that may go more as we get into trials and whether certain geographies are offering one trial versus another. Correct. Yeah, Allison, I, can I add one piece to that? Yes, sure. So I've done a lot of first time ever trials. The truth is, while it, you might have an assessment of what you think about the drug and its strategy, a lot of this is going to be about you and your family and where you're at with the disease. And are you doing well and you're comfortable and you're, you see there's a problem but you're getting by or is this thing really consuming you and really a burden and how, how much you are willing to think about risk? Because we definitely have families who say, I want to be first, I want to be, I need it now, I want it now. And the other families are just naturally more resistant to risk. But a lot of it has to do with where your kid's at and what you feel about that. So a lot of that is really more inside yourself, thinking through what I see in my own clinical situation and how comfortable am I putting our current situation at some risk for unknown in order for something better. So I think that's one of the things you have to think. There's doctors out there, but ultimately you're gonna have to come to your own sense of that, understanding the risk, but also <laughs> deciding how much risk is important to you given how much your kids are affected. I think you also wanted to yeah, comment. Yeah, uh, just, just very quickly. Um, I'll just give um, an anecdote from my own experience. Uh, some years ago, I was working for Dr. Crowley at uh, Amicus, and one thing that we did was that when we had a situation where we were not very sure, we'd ask ourselves around the table, would you put this drug in your child, or in your grandparent, or in your sister? And I think it's an important question for us to ask as physicians who are in clinical research, because you actually get, it switches on something else in your mind. And I think uh, what happened when at Amicus was that in one, in one case, we didn't put drug in a patient for two years. We had a two year delay. And then the drug went back into the clinic. And that's something that I've carried through. And I think uh, that question when it was asked, in my mind, I think the person who asked that question is wondering, are these people using us more as guinea pigs? But they wouldn't be in this thing themselves. But I think uh, what I've come to realize, having been in industry, is that many of us really were physicians first before we were researchers in industry. And we are actually a gateway if we do our work correctly. And I've found a lot of physicians who actually have this, that same mentality. So for me, I would not put drug in any human being that would not go into my own daughter. And I think the same thing applies to a lot of my colleagues. Yeah. I think that should always well be stated. true. Well stated. Um, so one question that a parent had, which is quite a great question, um, and I don't know that anyone can answer it, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, what will be your expanded access policy if an AS individual does not qualify for the clinical trial? I'm going to throw that at Emil Kekis. Well, it's, thanks, Allison. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, it's an area of very particular concern for me because I've been through a lot of first studies. And when you first get a treatment and it starts working, then the crisis begins, which are people that are not on the trial now want to get treated. And how do they get treated? And so uh, every company really should be setting up and thinking through what their early access policy will be. What I'd like first say is, Compassion access or emergency IND or expanded access type is one way of getting access. There's other things you can do as well. We try to also try to get companies to think about, you have your main trial, and that you should, first thing you should think about, are there people who wouldn't qualify for that trial, but for which we should study safety at least, and should we conduct a companion, what I call a companion non-qualifying trial, that you can put other kids or older people that may not qualify study their safety, learn about efficacy, but not create compl complications for your phase three trial because of what you're trying to study. So the, the uh, non-qualified companion type study is one way to provide access. 
particularly if it's not an urgent, like life-threatening situation. If things are more life-threatening, more damaging, we certainly offer it and do early access programs um, for, um, currently two of our programs have early access programs and we've treat, treated patients around the world with that. I think it's a responsibility to engage, but you have to have enough safety and efficacy information to feel that there is a, a positive benefit risk to putting that product out. The other thing I would say is that when we treat patients, for example, one of our products treats patients in acute heart failure that have a met metabolic defect, we also can collect information from them how it's working in those patients in crisis. And so we've been very successful working with the agency, FDA, and I mean, taking some of that data back into the filing actually as well in, in, in showing how the drug might work. So there is a benefit to potentially development when looking in those situations. But I think all companies are a little bit different, but I do think when you're dealing with a disease of this type, that thinking about your access plan, I think is really important, whether in trial or in expanded access. Great, thank you. Great, great answer. Um, the next question is, anyone else want to comment on that? Feel free to jump in. I'm sure none of you will. Um, if any therapeutics are available in the future, what are the areas where we might expect improvement and to what extent? Which is a difficult question to answer, but I'm going to give that one to Jennifer Panagoulias. Um, the, the answer is we don't know. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what will change. Um, we we um, study animals to get an idea of what, you know, some of the things, parameters that may change, but that doesn't necessarily always translate to what you can expect in, in patients. And so we study a variety of things because we, we may not know at the outset what's going to change. So I asked Jennifer because she has a family member who has Angelman syndrome, so she knows the symptoms that they live with, and I, I wanted to, to see her response on that. But I also want to ask Dr. Dewis, because you see a ton of patients with Angelman syndrome, and I think you have a really good sense of their capabilities that are not on paper. And so what, do you have a comment to that on what you expect might change? Well, I second that we don't know, um, and we're very hopeful and excited about the therapeutics coming. Um, I think that we all feel, or I'll speak for myself, I think that the earlier you treat for certain parts of Angelman syndrome, the more you're going to see a response. But one of the reasons it's so important to think critically about outcome measures, which a ton of work goes into, and one of the reasons it's so important to participate in some of these natural history trials is that there are things that we notice that change with Angelman at all ages. And so there's a potential for impact at every age, including in adults. So for example, one of the things I'm very interested in is mobility, and I didn't really appreciate until I started seeing a large number of individuals with Angelman syndrome, the change in mobility that occurs over time. And that's an example of something that we would, number one, want to have something very sensitive to pick up a change in mobility, but also a place where we may have a huge impact and it doesn't matter the age of the individual because that's changing over time. So I think this is where it's so critical and so much work goes into outcome measures. Um, and a lot of us try very hard to put data out quickly so that people can make informed decision about outcome measures from the industry perspective. So the answer is that there's probably changes that will occur at every age and until we truly understand the natural history, we're not gonna be able to sensitively pick those up. And humans are not mice, if we remember that. So what we see changing in mice doesn't mean that's what we're going to see changing in humans. So the only way we can answer that question is if we have clinical trials in humans. I think that's the answer. Um, OK, my next question is, can families of individuals living with Angelman syndrome who have a deletion size that's quite large still expect for ho hopeful outcomes with these genetic therapies? And I'm going to direct that at Dr. Baudet and Dr. Dewis because you are two geneticists. Oh, and, and Dr. Krakis is a geneticist as well. So maybe I'll direct that at the three of you who understand the genetics of Heidi syndrome. Yes, I, I think uh, last year at this meeting I gave a talk where I talked about how completely the abnormalities would be corrected for various patients. And the larger the deletion, the more you have maybe 15 other genes, which you still have only one copy of where normal people have two. Now, it's clear UBE3A plays the major role, but 
Um, I think there's going to be a, a potential, let's say, a, probably the ideal situation is a patient with a UBE 3A point mutation. There, you should be able to fix everything if you get there early enough. But, um, and, and also the imprinting and the uh, uh, UPD patients, you don't have a lot of other genes which are misexpressed. So the deletions, on the one hand, uh, probably have the most to gain, but they probably will be left with more residual than uh, the other genotypes. Thank you. Jessica, do you want to add to that? I think that was a very good answer. Okay. It's hard to follow up, Dr. Rodette. But um, the only thing I would add is that there's a lot of hopeful data that there's been a lot of questions today about whether these um, drugs will go first to different genotypes. And I definitely second that the UB3A mutation is probably the best one to study because it's a point mutation and we know that that's the only gene impacted. Um, but the other thing to think about and that we're seeing from some of the data coming out, I just want to point out is there seems to be, if you look at the data that's presented from the companies, which is really hard to appreciate, but there seems to be some counter in the cell where the body knows how much UBE3A is active and where it's coming from. And you see in the data that's been presented that as the, put, the father's expression goes up in UBE3A, the mom's goes down. Um, and so that's something really interesting because it suggests that while we're pretty, you know, some of us think about overexpression of UBE3A because of um, other disorders like duplication 15Q, it may be that we don't necessarily need to worry about that. So there's, so follow the data closely. It's very difficult, but it, this is why it's helpful to talk to people who know Angelman well, because there's a lot of reasons to be excited about this going to all the different genotypes. Maybe I could just follow up on what I said earlier. Uh, even for deletion patients, the potential for benefit is huge. And you know, maybe there's potential for a 90 or 85% correction of the phenotype, whereas maybe it could be closer to 100% for UBE3A point mutations. But I, I think all patients would benefit enormously compared to the kinds of treatments and benefits we tend to think of. This, um, it seems to me that all the patients should talk if they're treated young enough. Did you hear that? And based on the data we saw on the stem cell program, maybe not young enough. Maybe if they're adults, they'll have a full rescue. So I'm going with age doesn't matter. We'll see. We will see. Um, and to that point, too, I remember um, when my daughter was diagnosed early, I reached out to Dr. Baudet um, probably three or four years ago now, and uh, we had a conversation about how many kids in the, um, in the databases or individuals in the databases are documented with having a, a deletion or an effect of all the other genes but not UBE3A to know what the phenotype is of those individuals to be able to say, is there symptoms of an individual that has UBE3A but doesn't have the other genes that they're missing? Is there a deletion that doesn't involve UBE3A in the same region of Angelman syndrome deletion? And the answer I got was he tried to find patients in the database that had such a thing and he had a very hard time finding those patients. And his answer to me, if you recall, was it may be I can't find the patients because they're normal and nobody would ever do genetic testing on them because if there were a lot of patients like that, they either don't exist or they may not be terribly abnormal that we are not testing them. So there is a chance that adding UBE3A can make them to a point that that is maybe an OCD genotype, a, a phenotype or some type of behavioral phenotype that we call it something else, but it's not so serious that it required genetic testing. Yeah, you could imagine that having only one copy of one gene or five genes or 10 genes if that was the only thing wrong, you might be fine. But if that is on top of a major impact, right, like right. from UBE3A, you're now sensitized. Right. So it's very hard to guess and predict what might happen. Right, so that's what I just wanted to share with you deletion parents, that we just don't know. But there's probably great hope for all of them. Um, so this question was, is it too late for teens and adults in regards to age to benefit from gene-altering therapies? We've been waiting the longest time to any, compared to anybody else in this room for this day to come. And what is it too late for my child? 
And I think we kind of just answered that, and I was going to refer to the stem cell program that was talked about today, but I'm going to actually put that to Dr. Weber, because I feel like you have answered this for other people many times in the past, and I thought that your answer was very well thought years before. So can you answer that? Uh, yeah, I, I would say that, that you know, scientifically, in, in looking at this as a scientist, <clears throat> especially with the models that we've used, that... Um, that age doesn't matter, at least in those models, and we can recover pretty much everything uh, in adult animals that have had angel men their entire lives. Um, so, you know, the, the, the short answer is we don't know, and I think that some of these clinical trials that have been talked about um, that, that are going to start up and the ones in the future are going to start answering those questions. And, and it, it will, uh, a very smart person at uh, PTC told me that you know, these clinical trials are like the small part of an hourglass. And so they may be m very narrow at first, and the, these inclusion exclusion criteria may, may really limit, but once that safety and once that efficacy is answered, that it will spread out to all ages and in and, and all areas of the world and, and all particular age of patients everywhere. So I think it's a question that will be answered. Thank you. You want to answer too? Yeah. Yeah. So. I would say, based on seeing kids throughout life with Angelman, that it's never too late. <laughs> Round of applause for that. I agree. I agree. Um, I think the therapeutic window controversy may have just gotten riled up today after the data on the stem cell program. Yeah, Allison, I'll add one more thing, because you said that, that mice aren't people, and people aren't mice either. So I, I think you need to think about that as well when you're, when you're hearing some of these studies that have been done with mice or therapeutic windows that, um, you know, it's, it's vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. So this question is, has recent research in wild-type monkeys or any other subjects put a finger point on the effect of UBE3 overexpression? In other words, are any of these animal models exhibiting autistic or other unexpected traits? And I'm going to actually give that to Lauren Black, because Lauren Black works with so many programs, not just for Angelman, but for many other disorders in non-human primates through Charles River. And I feel like you've been intimately involved in many programs, so you might be able to help answer what the translation is to monkeys. Thank you. I'm very, I'm just honored to be here. Thank you for having me up. The, um, I'd say we, it'd be very difficult to tell what an autistic monkey looks like. Um, they have a variety of different behaviors, and in fact, we've got a behavioral pharmacologist in the room, Dr. Norton from Charles River. Maybe we can pen him down during the cocktail hour. But um, I think it's very difficult to know exactly what a monkey's thinking or if they're communicating. Uh, we can look at their behavior. We can enumerate like how many times they interact with each other because they're in social cages. And we can look at their team-team interactions or they're picking at each other and all the things that monkeys do that look like preschool. Um, as far as we know from our own studies with, with monkeys, we haven't seen any um, aberrant, um, what I would call <laughs> neurotic or autistic or uncommunicative behaviors. Um, they don't become asocial, you know, that sort of thing. And I think you would have to have a very gross change to really observe that in the monkey. So that's not what they're doing. They're behaving like ordinary animals. And as you're aware, if we get up to high doses with intrathecal uh, doses, it could be anesthetics, it can be pain meds, it can be intrathecal oligonucleotides. Once we get to high enough doses, there can be intoxication that's observable as a gate change. And what's nice is when we get to those dose, we don't go any higher. And we wait and we watch the animal carefully, and those have usually resolved in a few hours. If not 12 hours the next day, they're just fine. So I think that's the sort of thing when someone asked earlier what might be a change that we would put into the clinical monitoring plan. If there was to be something wrong, there would be a line in our informed consent form that says let's observe the patients for 12 to 24 hours and make sure that there's no observable changes in their gait. And I think that's the only thing that we've really noticed in the monkeys that could be something that we would definitely carry forward that's unique to the intrathecal route. Thank you. And also to, to, to put a little comment on that, Paula and I were at a, um, a conference in, back in May or in the spring, and someone actually did present um, from the UC Davis Primate Center on autistic monkeys. 
And what they found, it was very interesting, and I'll just summarize this in two seconds, but they found these abnormal behaviors that were antisocial in these monkeys, and they did CSF taps, and they were looking at um, any biomarkers in, in so appropriately social and unsocial monkeys, and there was a clear um, group of monkeys that were unsocial, and those that were missing some of these biomarkers were the ones that were terribly unsocial, and that was similar to biomarkers they were seeing in, in some genetic forms of autism. Um, in the CSF taps of kids with autism. So I actually think you'd have to very carefully understand what an autistic monkey looks like, but there actually might be autistic monkeys. Yeah. Let me ask one question then. So these were animals that weren't drug challenged? No, not at all. They just were antisocial monkeys and they, they were exploring why. They think that they had why. a mutation? Yeah, they think it was a genetic form of autism. Well, fabulous. Yeah, Let's get a crazy. documentation of that going. Yeah, I think they That'd were publishing it. So it was, pretty, we, it was pretty incredible. Um, okay, on another topic. So in the event there is an ill effect from an ASO, um, what is the typical half-life for wear off where you think that that event would go away? So I'm gonna give this to Michelle, since you talked a lot about half-life today of ASOs. So that's, a, that's a, a question that would depend, the answer to that question will depend on the dose that's given. Um, so what's been observed for a, a number of, of ASOs in, in different situations, um, and that includes LNAs, is that um, the half-life, the duration, so how long the effect lasts is dependent um, generally on the dose level that's given. And one of the things that we're all working towards is to have um, molecules that have a long duration of action because of the intrathecal route of administration. So we don't want families to have to keep coming back to clinic very often, so we do want medications or in the future, so there'll be molecules in development first, but the molecules to be in development to have a long half-life as part of the, um, the good features of them um, in terms of convenience. So that is a trade-off between the dose that would need to be given to achieve a certain um, interval of, of dosing, and then them having a longer half-life, and then the, the time that they're active in the system. So that's, that's the, the, the conceptual answer to that question, is that it will really depend on the dose that's given and the specific properties of that molecule. So I wouldn't be able to tell you a specific um, time period today. It would really depend on the molecule. And people are wel welcome to add to that. I think that's a great answer. I'm sure no one has anything to add. And this is the last question. Um, and I'm gonna direct this at Dr. Wilson. Is there a particular virus that our children need to stay away from and ensure that they don't pick up and build up an immunity to a virus for viral delivery for gene therapy? Well, <clears throat> it depends how the virus is gonna be delivered and uh, what the virus is. But if you're injecting the virus in the cerebral spinal fluid, ventricle, cisterna magna, lumbar puncture, pre-existing immunity to that virus does not impact at all on the uh, efficacy or safety of that. Uh, that's in contrast to uh, clinical trials of gene therapy, such as with hemophilia or spinal muscular atrophy type 1, where you inject the vector into the blood. And that is a real issue uh, with those families and those programs. But I suspect this will be an injection in the CSF, so uh, antibodies should not play a role at all in selection of, uh, of uh, research subjects or patients. Great. And I doubt you can, maybe you can answer the question, since Dr. Abedi is not here, about lentivirus for hematopoietic stem cell, since that's given IV. Do you have any experience <laughs> with lentivirus, Dr. Wilson? Not really, but if you... You mean a lentiviral transduced cell that's then transplanted into the patient? Yeah, since it's going to go systemic. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't think, uh, since the correction is down outside the body, I don't think that would be a problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so can we give a round of applause to our wonderful panelists? <laughs>